Yeah. Afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Good to be able to gather for worship this uh, Sunday morning. Just a few announcements as we begin. First of all, there's a joint uh, session meeting this Tuesday via Zoom, uh, and I'll send out a link for that uh, in the next day or two. Uh, midweek Bible study and prayer meeting this week's in the Atchison Hall, so that's Wednesday at 8, and you're very much encouraged to come along for that. Then the Thursday morning prayer meeting resumed Thursday past, and it's on again this week, and that's 10.15 downstairs in the Atchison Hall. Then next Sunday is our communion service at our usual time here of 12 noon, so communion next Sunday here in the church. Now, my camera... The camera on my phone is broken. So Claire's going to take the picture this week uh, from opposite. Oh, apparently she's done it already. There you go, there's efficiency. So thank you. Uh, right. We'll begin by reading these words from First Chronicles 16, 29 to 30. We need worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. We're told to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And we're going to stand and sing together, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. 
Oh Lord, we bow before you this morning. We bow before you, praising you as the Almighty God, the one who is holy, holy, holy. And as we come into your holy and loving presence, we bring to mind all that you've done for us. We remember how Christ suffered for us. We remember how we're called to love as you first loved us. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, and our neighbour as ourselves. As we worship you today, we pray that you'd open our eyes and hearts, that we might see the Lord Jesus more clearly, that we would understand more and more of your love for us, shown in him. We confess that all too easily we turn our minds away from you. We allow the busyness of the working week to consume our thoughts and our time so that worship of you is pushed far from our minds. All too often we come to church perhaps feeling a, a sense of guilt that we've given you little thoughts since the Sunday before or that we've rushed out to church having barely found the time to settle and quieten ourselves before you. Loving Father, we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful, thankful for your mercies which are new every morning. For the fact that you welcome us and delight in us as we come to you. So in light of your grace, we pray that you would forgive us afresh. But not just forgive us, that you would remind us deep in our hearts that we're loved by you. That we're loved as your children. Children clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Bless each one as we meet, Lord. But whether we're here in the church building or joining from home, pour out your blessings, we pray. And on all those who gather in different places around the world as part of the great church of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Grant us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Equip us for the challenges of the future and even of the, of the week ahead. Deepen our fellowship with one another. And when we leave this house of prayer, may it be with joy in our hearts, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, boys and girls, I have a question for you. Tell me, do you know what opened again on Friday that people had been waiting for to open a long time? Lexi. The hairdressers, that's right. So people had been waiting for the hairdressers to open and people are kind of counting down the days until uh, they did. Uh, and sometimes we like to change the way we look. Maybe we, like, maybe we might cut, get our hair cut a different way. We might grow it longer. Some of us have had to grow it longer in, in recent times. Maybe we might dye it a different color. Maybe we might do something else. Like go a beard or something. People can go to extreme lengths to change the way they look. Some even go as far as having surgery of some kind or another. But I was going to have a bit of a makeover this morning. So if I was to change how I looked, what kind of things could I do? Holly. Put my hair in a ponytail. I couldn't quite put it in a ponytail today. What do you think? Shave my head. <laughs> I'm not going to do that today either. Uh, Lexi, what do you think? Put a wig on, yeah. I'll see if I've got a wig. Okay, what colour of wig do you think would suit me? Blonde. I don't have blonde. Darcy, what do you think? Red. Connie, you probably know. You probably know what's in the cupboard. What do you think? A pink one? Will I have a look? Yeah. So, you were close, Darcy, yeah. And Connie, you got it. It's this, oh, nice pink one. Okay, what else could it do? Holly? Glasses, yeah. Oh. Okay, glasses, anything else? Yeah, Holly? <laughs> 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 
Funny, we read about makeup later in, this, later in, this, later in our passage, um, but I don't have any with me. So, sorry about that. No, make, no lipstick, Adam? A scarf. Well, I don't have a scarf, but I've got a coat. So I can change my clothes. And also, one last thing. I can put on a hat. So, to change on the outside, there's lots of different things we can do. <laughs> if only... <laughs> if only I'd spoken to you all before, I could have got the lipstick and uh, shaved my head, brought clippers with me, or maybe I should have just brought dye, might have been better. Uh, I could have done all these different things to change the way I look, but you know, I can only really change the way I look on the outside. I can't change the way I look on the inside. So I can do certain things, but they'll only go so far. And you know, the Bible tells us there's a more important change than the way we look. A more important change than what we do with our hair or our clothes or anything like that. The Bible tells us we need to be changed in our heart. But how can that happen? We can't just go and the hairdressers for it. We can't go and get surgery for it. We can't go to the clothes shop for it. So what do we need to do? Well, Jesus said if we want to come into God's kingdom and become a child of God, we need to ask him for, forgive, ask him for forgiveness and a new life. And when we ask Jesus to forgive us, and he gives us his Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of us and he changes us. He changes us so we come to love God, so we come to love others more, and so that we can live more the way that God wants us to live. And the Holy Spirit brings that change inside of us. And it's a change that lasts forever. So these, this change will only last as long as I keep the things on for. So, you know, even if I kept the pink hair for the rest of my life, it would still only be to the rest of, rest of yeah. It would still only be for the rest of my life. But when we ask Jesus to come and change us and to forgive us and give us new life, it's new life forever. Forever. So, yes, we're going to have a change on the outside, but the change on the inside is much more important. God wants to give us an internal makeover, you could say. A change in the inside. So we can come into his kingdom and be his children. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your promise in the Bible of a new heart when we come to you through Jesus. You promise to forgive us and welcome us as your beloved children. Lord, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son Jesus to this earth for us. And thank you that through him we can be forgiven and receive the wonderful new life you have for us. Lord, Bless us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing together now, and it's the hymn, God is So Good. So 
Today we come to the last in our series looking at the stories of Elijah and Elisha. And today we're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. So it's quite a long chapter. It goes through to the end of verse 37. Um, we'll read this first section now. The middle bit I'll, I'll kind of summarize when we come to the sermon. Then we'll read the last section where we read about the makeup and Jezebel painting her eyes. We'll read that uh, towards the end of the sermon. But for now we'll read 2 Kings 9 verses 1 to 13. So the words will be on the screen, but if you've got a Bible, do please uh, join and read along with me. So let's read the word of God together. The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. Don't delay. So the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us? asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil in Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. And I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And he opened the door and ran. When Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, Is everything all right? Why did this madman come to you? You know the man and the sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That's not true, they said. Tell us. Jehu said, here's what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Amen. We thank the Lord for this reading of his word. You'll have seen in the news this week the uh, serious situation with COVID in India uh, and I suppose that how the hospitals are, are overflowing and running out of oxygen. Well, this prayer request came from the Leprosy Mission in India yesterday. It gives us a bit of an illustration of the situation. I'm, I'm going to read that before we pray. So it says... Uh, urgent prayer request from leprosy mission colleagues in India, where 40 uh, mission India, uh, leprosy mission India staff are now affected with COVID, three hospitalised and 37 under home treatment. Dr Mary Verghees, the country leader, is one of three that has been hospitalised. She is stable but has fever. 37 leprosy mission India family members are affected, nine hospitalised and five leprosy patients are affected. The government has requested three leprosy mission hospitals to join the current COVID management. It's not clear if other hospitals will be requested to do the same as the situation worsens. As our brothers and sisters at Leprosy Mission India and the nation of India as a whole struggles with the impact of this virus, let's join together in prayer for this situation. So we pray for that situation. We also pray for the church in the Republic of Ireland who are unable to meet in person as of yet and also pray for the moderator and his ongoing work. So let's pray together. Psalm 116 verse 1 says this. 
I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Lord, we pray that you would hear our cry for mercy for the country of India, where the number of cases has shot up dramatically and, and deaths, deaths has shot up dramatically due to COVID over this past week. We pray for your hand upon that land that the cases would begin reducing as well as the deaths. And we pray especially for the work of the leprosy mission in India as they've seen staff and family members hospitalized and, and sick. We pray, Lord, for your blessing, for your healing. We pray that they would know your help as a mission at this time. We pray for them as some of their hospitals join the COVID management situation and pray for them and for the whole country of India that, that they would know your help and a sense uh, just that they can, uh, a sense just that you're with them through all this, that many would turn to you and put their trust in you. We pray also for our brothers and sisters in the south at this time and pray that they would be able to, to resume in-person worship in the very near future. We pray that as they meet online today that you would encourage them and bless them as they wait and pray. We pray also for, for the moderator as he has, is having increasing opportunities to visit congregations as the regulations here gradually, uh, or the restrictions here gradually relax. We pray for him and for his ongoing ministry of encouragement and pastoral care to ministers and their families and pray uh, you would bless him and help him in that. We pray also for ourselves as a congregation that we would know your, your blessing, that whether we're here in church today or at home, or uh, we pray you would draw alongside us. We think of those who are unwell. We think of those who are in particular need of prayer at this time and ask that you would come alongside um, to strengthen them and help them. We pray also, Lord, as we bring our offerings to you, we thank you that we can bring our prayers to you. And as you bring our offerings, we pray you would accept them and use them in your service. And as we turn now to your word, as we turn to this final section of the story of Elisha and what in many ways is a difficult and challenging passage, we pray you'd speak into each of our hearts, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us through your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Warning, this report contains scenes which some viewers may find distressing. This report contains scenes some viewers may find distressing. Words which we sometimes hear on our TV news reports, words which we almost certainly would have heard if the details of today's passage were being broadcast on TV to the people of their day. News of kings being slaughtered, a queen coming to a violent and even disturbing end. News of the end of an era, of the end of the dynasty of the family of Ahab. It was an end that had been forecast, an end that had been prophesied back in 1 Kings 21. We can read the story of Naboth's vineyard and the murder of Naboth there and his sons. And it's a story which finishes with God promising. I will not bring disaster in this day, but I will bring it on his house, Ahab's house, in the days of his son. Ahab was perhaps the most wicked king ever to sit on the throne of either the northern or southern king, southern kingdom of Israel. Just to remind you, at this time Israel was split in two. You had the north called Israel and the south called Judah. And as we'll see, both their kings will die later in the passage. Uh, and as I've said, Ahab was perhaps the most wicked king to sit in either throne of the kingdoms. And all through our series, we've seen this quite often in the background, but sometimes in the foreground of the passage. His 22 years as king were filled with all kinds of, of sins. Back in the first week of the series, we read that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord to anger 
and did all the kings of Israel before him. And his sons and his grandson followed down exactly the same sinful road as their father and grandfather before them. And today that road comes to an end. But it's an end that brings us to a difficult and yet an important truth of the gospel. The truth that whilst the gospel is good news for God's people, that it also constitutes bad news for those who reject him. That whilst there's the promise of rescue for those who turn to the Lord, there's only the reality of judgment for those who don't. We see the two kings in our passage refuse to turn to the Lord. And we see them killed, Joram and, Ah and Ahaziah, and along with them, the infamous Queen Jezebel, a woman whose very name has become synonymous with evil and wickedness. There's no rescue for them. There's no rescue when, they're, when they refuse to repent and turn to the Lord. That's what we're going to see in the passage today. So we see, I suppose, three things. We see, firstly, a decision, and then two dangers. A decision and two dangers. So the decision is that the Lord decides it's the time for judgment. The Lord decides the time is right for judgment. Right from the start of the chapter, we get a, a sense that whilst many years have passed since the promise of judgment was made, that the Lord has decided that now the time is right for judgment and it's going to come quickly and swiftly. We get a sense of this in verse 1. Elisha summons a man from the company of the prophets and commissions him to appoint, or sorry, rather to anoint Jehu as king and to tell him the task that God has for him. And he says, tuck your cloak into your belt. So he's told to tuck his cloak into his belt. And any time we see that in the Bible, it's because somebody's in a rush. We see it in um, the story of the prodigal son. The father kind of gets the cloak out of the way so he can run quickly to welcome the son. Well, here, Jehu, or sorry, the prophet's told to tuck his cloak into his belt so he can go quickly with this news. And as we see, he's to bring good news for Jehu, but also bad news. Good news that he's going to be the king. But bad news that he's been given this, this dangerous, this, uh, I suppose, awesome task of uh, being the one to kill Ahab's family line. That he's been chosen to be God's instrument of judgment on that wicked dynasty. And you see, Joram was an officer, or sorry, Jehu was an officer in Joram's army, an, offer, an officer of standing, and perhaps. Elisha didn't know, will he, will he be loyal to the king? Will he take out his anger on this task on the prophet here? He doesn't know, but he tells him to rush on just in case. So uh, as we're going to see, the prophet tells him the news and then he rushes off back home. So he finds him, he pours the oil on his head to anoint him as king. And then he tells him his task. And in verse 9, the Lord says, I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. Who were they and what happened then? Well, they were previous kings whose reigns as king had come to an end because of their sin. And the Lord is saying here, uh, sorry, and it goes on, as for Jezebel, we're told that uh, dogs will devour her in the plot of ground at Jezreel and no one will bury her. So that's what will happen in Jezebel. And we're also told that the king's reign will come to an end like the kings of before because of their sin. So the, the prophet delivers his message and runs as he was told. And then Jehu goes back out and they say, is everything all right? Why did this madman come to you? This is a chapter with madmen spoken about a time or two because there's a madman spoken about here. And later in the chapter, we're told that Jehu drove his chariot like a madman. Maybe you know somebody drives a car like a madman. Well, Jehu drove his chariot like a madman. And also they reckon here that this prophet was a bit of a madman. And when they say, what did the madman tell you? Jehu says, well, you know what he's like. 
You know that fella, the sort of things he says. And they, they press him on it. Because I think probably, unless he'd time to get out the head and shoulders and wash the hair, they would have seen the, the oil, they would have smelt the oil and thought, why is he coming out here with oil on his head? They want to find out. So eventually he says, I've been anointed king. And then as the scene reminds us a bit of um, Palm Sunday, because we see them spread their cloaks on the ground, they blow the trumpet, and they say, Jehu is king. Why were they so enthusiastic, do you think? If they were officers in King Joram's army, why were they so enthusiastic about this potential mutiny, about this potential army takeover, about their man becoming king? Why were they so enthusiastic? Well, it's because I imagine Joram wasn't that popular as king. The country weren't doing so well in battles with, with Aram. They'd gone through famine, and there may well have been rumblings of discontent. Rumblings that leave the army only too happy to get behind their man. Rumblings that leave them ready to mutiny. Jehu is going to be God's tool, God's instrument for dealing with the wickedness of Ahab's family. But notice that whilst Jehu will be in the means here, God's the driver. God's the, the catalyst. Look at the repeated eyes in verses 6 to 10. I anoint you. I will avenge. I will cut off. What's it telling us here? Well, it's a reminder that God doesn't stand back disinterested when he sees evil in the world around him. He doesn't stand impotent against the evil in our world or ignorant of the evil in our world. But God stands ready, ready to act in his time and in his way. God stands, he knows all that goes on in the world. And God chooses at times of his determination and in ways that he determines. The Lord decides here it's time to act. But also then we see that he acts through Jehu, and we see this in verses uh, 14 to 29, where we see the danger of being oblivious to the consequences of sin, the danger of being oblivious to sin's consequences. An event that people sometimes go to see when they are visiting London as tourists is the changing of the guard. And I often think that the guards have a difficult job to do in a slightly strange way. You might think, well, they stand there and do nothing for two hours. But if they stand there, you know, straight as a die, with the big hats on, the red jackets, uh, they need to maintain concentration while standing dead still. And usually they're standing there and there isn't that much for them to see. There's a little sign of a threat. Well, I wonder if that was the case with the lookout on the wall at Jezreel. Standing there for hours on end, he seen nothing until verse 17. I see some troops coming. And the king, Joram, says, get the, get the horsemen or get a horseman. So Joram had been defending, the king had been defending uh, Ramoth Gilead from the Aramans. But he got, got injuries, so he'd come back here to Jezreel to recover. And whilst there, the other king, Ahaziah, had come to him. So the kings of the north and south were both there. The southern king was the nephew of the northern king. And we're told that they both walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. And so they were both there at Jezreel. And so when Joram hears of troops coming, he sends a horseman out to ask, do you come in peace? And the question literally means, is all well? You see, Joram didn't know what had gone on at Ramoth Gilead. He didn't know that uh, Jehu had been anointed king and was coming uh, to kill him. He was oblivious to the fact that judgment for him was coming. And so it's in ignorance that he sends out the horseman with this question. And it's a question that receives the answer, what have you to do with peace? Fall in behind me. And it's an order of the horseman of ace. The same thing happens a second time. And so after both 
after both occasions, Joram himself goes out. He's told, well, there's Jehu's crazy chariot driving. So he goes out to meet him, oblivious to the threat, oblivious to the danger. And so he asks the question, have you come in peace, Jehu? And Jehu asks this, and it's an important question. How can there be peace as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? It makes clear the reason why judgment has come. It makes clear the reason why God has decided it's time to act. It's time to uh, bring judgment against the house of Ahab. They're still engaging in idolatry and witchcraft and all the different sin that comes along with that. Jehu makes clear, no, he hasn't come in peace. And so Joram goes to escape and he calls Ahaziah at the same time and they both end up killed. With Joram's body we see being thrown in Naboth's field. Naboth had been murdered along with his sons just to get the field. And that's where Joram's body ends up being thrown. Joram and Ahaziah both come to a sorry end. Both oblivious to the consequences of their sin. Both oblivious to the truth. The truth that, as we said, it's a difficult truth, yet an important truth. That sin has consequences. That sin will be judged. Joram and Ahaziah were oblivious to the truth. And so many people of every generation live oblivious to this truth. They think, well, my sin doesn't matter. My, that doesn't apply to me. I can live the way I want. A few people ever live lives as serious, where, where their sin is as serious as that of the wicked house of Ahab. Yet all of us sin in some way or another. And all sin has consequences. Joram and Ahaziah discovered this all too late. It was too late when they discovered the consequences for their sin. But what about Jezebel? Did she turn to God in time? Well, we'll see she didn't as we read the final part of the story. Verses 30 to 37, the danger of an unrepentant life. So verses 30 to 37. Then Jehu went to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, she painted her eyes, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, Emery, you murderer of your master? He looked up at the window and called out, Who's on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered the wall and the horses, the horses as they trampled her underfoot. Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Jehu, who said, This is the word of the Lord, that he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like refuse on the ground in the plot at Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. She does her best to go out in style, doesn't she? She puts on her makeup, she fixes her hair, she's still a queen in appearance, and she still has the same haughty and arrogance that she always had. She taunts Jehu, murderer of your master. She goes down fighting to the end. She goes out in style, or so she thinks, but in fact her end is the ultimate humiliation. Thrown out the window before, and devoured, before being devoured by the dogs as promised, without even the dignity of a burial. It's not pretty, and it's not meant to be. Her wicked life leads to this gross judgment. It can be a difficult read. It can be difficult to read this and think, well, why is it like this? But it's also difficult if you look back and see Jezebel's persecution of God's people. I mean, look back even to the story of Elijah at Mount Carmel to get a flavor of that. 
It can be difficult as well when we read of God's people being persecuted around the world today by those whose attitude to the Lord is similar to that of Jezebel. In spite of her sin, she was determined to die with her head held high. She died, you could argue, a brave death. Yet a brave death does not compensate for an unrepentant life. Suicide bombers, you could argue, die a brave death. But any bravery that they or anyone else shows uh, does not compensate for a refusal to turn to God. You know, it can be easy to look back over the lives of people like Jezebel, Joram, Ahaziah, and say, well, I'm nothing like them. And in many ways, most ways, we aren't. As I've said, very few people in history lived lives of wickedness the way that the house of Ahab did. And yet, we've all sinned. We've all sinned in some way or another. We're all sinned to the point that we deserve the judgment of God. The judgment of the kings here was promised. It was promised long before this, yet their wickedness continued. So why did God give them so long? Why did God wait from making the promise in Elijah's time through until now? Well, I think Second Peter 3 tells us in verse 9 where we read these words. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God waits because he's patient. He's patient with the two kings. He's patient with Jezebel. He gave them time. He was patient with them. And yet they refused to come to him. He's patient with us as well. He's patient and he waits to give us time to him. Time to turn to him because he's gracious. He waits because he, he loves you. And he's given you time to come to him as Lord. He's given us time to come to him and escape the judgment that's promised. But how is escape possible? Well, escape is possible because whilst King Joram died for his sins and the sins of his father, King Jesus died for our sins so we might know his father. Whilst King Joram died for his sins and the sins of his father, or the, Jesus died for our sins that we might know his father. He died for our sins that by the grace of God we could be rescued and given the hope and assurance of eternal life with God in heaven through Christ our Lord. This is a difficult passage. It's difficult to read. Difficult to hear. But there's good news. There's good news that whilst Joram, Ahaziah, Jezebel came to a sorry end, we don't need to. Because Jesus went to a sorry end for us. Because Jesus died the death on the cross we deserve. He took the judgment we deserve so we could come to him as our Lord and know him as our King. God's patient with us. He doesn't want anyone to perish. But he wants everyone to come to repentance and come to him. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for this series we've looked at, looking at the lives of Elijah and Elisha. We thank you for their faithfulness. We thank you for their faithfulness in proclaiming the message you gave them. And Lord, as we look at today's passage and think about today's passage, it, it was a difficult read. But we recognize that just as uh, the kings and Jezebel deserve the judgment that came to them, we recognize that left to ourselves, we're deserving of judgment as well. That our sins uh, would, uh, our sins are abhorrent to you. And that the wages of sin our death. Lord, we thank you that Jesus took our sins on himself, that Jesus took the judgment that should have been ours, 
that we could be forgiven and know you as our God. Lord, thank you for your mercy to us in Christ. Lord, help us not to ignore that mercy. Help us not to ignore your grace. But help us day by day to come to you and keep coming to you with thankful hearts for your mercy to us. Lord, help us not to live oblivious to our sins. Help us not to ignore our sins, but help us to turn from them and to turn to you day by day. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you've granted us through forgiveness in Christ. And we pray you would help us to be those who who share that hope with others. That you would help us to be those who share the good news of your forgiveness to us. Lord, bless your word to us and continue to draw us closer to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We come now to our closing hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Amen.